Hello, good evening. My name is Kirsten Bach. I'm the Interim Director of Arts at the Exploratorium. I would like to begin tonight by welcome you, welcoming you all back to the Exploratorium after an unprecedented 15-month closure in the 50-plus year history of the Exploratorium. It's been wonderful to open our doors to you again, even with our masks on. I welcome you to this conversation on one of our first evenings of After Dark programming since our reopening on July 1. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge that the Exploratorium is on the land and waters of the Ramatush Ohlone people, who in accordance with their traditions have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place in relationship to all who reside in and benefit from their traditional territory. We pay our respect to the Ramatush Ohlone elders, both past and present. This program is also being broadcast live in collaboration with Arts, Letters, and Numbers as part of their exhibition titled Sunship, the Ark That Makes the Flood Possible, held with, within the City X Italian Virtual Pavilion of the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale. This program is the first of at least 10 upcoming Zoom programs through November, also known as Mr. Weschler's Cabinet of Wonders. For further details, just Google Arts, Letters, and Numbers Sunship. We also give our thanks and appreciation to artist, architect, writer, and educator, as well as the founding director of Arts, Letters, and Numbers, David Gersten, for this collaboration. Tonight, we're going to hear all about the wondrous artwork, Aperture Lucida, that artist Tristan Duke created during his residency at the Exploratorium. Art plays a very important role in all that we do here. As a learning institution, the arts provide yet another entry point to learning. Art can be a language and a way of investigation that gives insight leading to understanding and a way of knowing. This path of inquiry through the arts, I believe is the perfect way of introducing Tristan Duke and his work to you. His art practice truly embodies this notion of art as a way of knowing. the papers. <laughs> the Exploratorium Artist in Residence Program was established in 1974. At its best, it provides an experience where the artist learns from us and we learn from them. Tristan's residency has done exactly that. A true inquirer, Tristan Duke is an artist and inventor working at the intersection of art, science, and <laughs> contemplative practice. <laughs> that was a big word for tonight with a, a special interest in optics, perception, and illusion, Duke explores visual ways of knowing, inventing new mediums and engaging viewers in unexpected and dynamic ways. Tristan will be joined in conversation tonight via live stream with the writer extraordinaire, Lawrence Weschler, who also dives headfirst into inquiry. As author Dave Eggers has noted, his writing weaves a crazy and gorgeous web between science, images, poetry, and every other great human endeavor. For over 20 years, Weschler was a staff writer at The New Yorker. He was the director, now emeritus, of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU, and has served as the artistic director of the Chicago Humanities Festival. He continues to write regularly for Vanity Fair, The Atlantic, The Nation, McSweeney's, and many other publications. His over 20 books include Seeing is Forgetting the Name of the Thing One Sees on artist Robert Irwin, Mr. Wilson's Cabinet of Wonder on the Museum of Jurassic Technology in Los Angeles, and most recently, a biographical memoir chronicling his 35-year friendship with the neurologist Oliver Sacks, entitled, And How Are You, Dr. Sacks? Lawrence Weschler is also a former Ocher Fellow at the Exploratorium. I could give endless accolades and bio information on our speakers tonight, but without further ado, I would like to give the mic over for the conversation at hand toward a holographic panoptics of the mind. Thank you. Hello, <laughs> Hello everybody. Oh, you see Ren Weschler here on our little monitor. <laughs> Yeah, we were hoping that I could have little hands on the on the uh, 
<laughs> on the armchair there, we can put gloves to indicate that I was a real person. But anyway, uh, Tristan, it's so good to see you. And I thought we could talk a bit uh, precisely about your practice, uh, which has fascinated me for a long time. Uh, and all that as a way of leading to a conversation about this remarkable piece that you premiered, was it 15 months ago? Uh, yeah, just over, yeah. Yeah, and, and the Aperture Lucida, which we'll get to presently. Um, no sooner had you premiered it, the whole place shut down, and you almost shut down. You were, I, I suspect you were one of the first people to get COVID, actually. Uh, <laughs> on opening night, you were really, really sick. Yeah. But anyway, um, it's good to open it again, and be there with you doing so. So I was thinking we could talk a little bit about your prior practice. I know you put together some slides that you could walk us through some of those. Uh, because I think uh, that this didn't come out of nowhere. In fact, many, many of your earlier uh, pieces uh, rhyme interestingly with the, with the piece we finally ended up doing for the, for the Exploratorium. So. Yeah. So <clears throat> at, at your request, Ren, I included a slide here of uh, this is a much older piece. This dates back to uh, over 15 years ago, um, doing these uh, small where were, you, where were you? You were in your, the town you grew up in, right? Yeah, that yeah. Piece. So this is, the, I started doing these pieces when I was uh, still living in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Uh, and then I moved to Boulder, Colorado, uh, and I was still making these miniature dioramas. So these are, like little boxes with lenses on them. And then when you look inside the lens, you see these little miniature scenes and sometimes little things happen with uh, kind of lights turning on and different sort of uh, dynamic things happening in the miniature rooms. But these are actually- The eyepiece that you were looking through uh, in these pieces, uh, they were carried down a apartment building across the street and you just tore out all the eyepieces from the doors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, these were these were peepholes from doors that were scavenged. Um, so yeah, and and these are actually dioramas. So they're three dimensional little rooms. Um, another kind of uh, next series of work a little later in my work. Uh, these are actually holograms, um, but you can kind of see the similar uh, sensibility here with these. Uh, sort of viewing boxes built with light fixtures built in. Um, there's a view looking in to one of the holograms. Before, um, let's go, go back to the hologram for a second, because I just want to say that, that, so you were still doing this, this is what you were doing after high school, but you hadn't decided what you were gonna do with college yet. And you then, well into this period, so uh, you had to decide where to go to college and you, I think it came down to Cal Arts or Naropa. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and why did you end up choosing Naropa? And first, say what Naropa was. Yeah, so Naropa University uh, is a, it's a Buddhist inspired kind of uh, curriculum that was founded by Allen Ginsberg uh, along with uh, a Tibetan Lama named Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. Um, and so it's a, it's a contemplative based, uh, university. And I, I think the, the piece, the, the reason that I ended up at Naropa was that so much of my work really is all about kind of mind and perception and thinking about how we see and make meaning in the world. Um, and so a lot of my work is infused with that kind of, uh, sense of inquiry and, um, Really looking at at perception as as the as the focus. I, I, I asked you that because um, I, I wrote a piece about you um, called "The Magus in His Youth." I never <laughs> got around to writing the Magus in his prime yet, but I'll do that one of these days. But it ran in this magazine, and, and um, which probably disappeared. I think we killed the magazine. Uh, but on the cover was this micro miniature chair. Yeah, and uh, there were never a few things you were doing at Naropa. One of them was that you did a piece about, which I think will become important a little bit later, also about the acoustics 
of the Japanese tea ceremony. Yeah. Uh, and we'll talk about that more later. But, but the thing that was interesting here is that after you've done these dioramas that you're looking at there, the holograms, you actually went into micro miniature sculpture where you were doing incredibly, incredibly precise uh, using literally individual hairs to make a chair. Yeah. And uh, the, the way the piece ends, I, I, while I was I was in the virtual uh, dark green room right now, while all of you were gathering, I was in the dark. But but I was able to just remind myself. I'm at the end of the piece, and it talks about this practice you did of how you were try, tried, how incredibly difficult it was to make this chair. Yeah. And how yeah. at one point you absolutely the first time you almost had it done, and just as you were turning to the attachment of the final leg of the chair. Uh, an exceptionally delicate moment in the process, a slight flicker of frustration flashed across your mind, instantaneously transmitting itself to the tips of his fingers. Though his hands shuddered barely a 32nd of an inch, he figures, the sculpture looked like it had been run over by a truck. <laughs> the next day he started again and you got all the way to the end and you just went out of an exhalation of, of excitement and the hurricane blew away the chair that you made. You did a whole third attempt to do it. The next day, a third attempt, steady, steady, steady. And only after he'd safely stowed the completed chair under an upturned cup, did he let out a full exhalation. At which point he felt the sudden desire to be out and about under the bright sun of the vast Colorado sky, jogging up a winding mountain road. Breathing deeply, he concluded, this is our conversation, my arms swinging freely and with my heart pounding, I was suddenly struck by an expansiveness unlike anything I had experienced. I felt so tiny and yet gigantic all at the same time. As my feet pounded against the mountain path, I was repeating the mantra, I am the point of a very fine needle. <laughs> we'll get to that in a few minutes, but uh, I thought it's interesting that that piece ends that way. So let's get so after that you began doing some other things. So let's go back to some of these other pictures you have for us. Yeah, so a lot of the work uh, that I've been doing in the last 10 years has been around this idea of uh, hand hand drawn holography. So um, these, these are hand etched holograms. Yeah, so the, these the, the way that I would describe this is that um, these are kind of the analog of uh, you know, uh, photography is to drawing as holography is to this technique. So it, it really is a holographic drawing technique. It's all done by hand. Um, and I'm carving these uh, essentially micro reflectors onto the surface of a, a polished plate to- I must I should tell you, by the way, you can get a sense of it here with the image, but this is a two dimensional thing. When you're in front of it, they are literally floating, hovering. Yeah. Two, two, these are platonic solids hovering uh, two or three or four inches above the above the surface. Yeah, Amazing. exactly. Yeah, so you can get a little bit of a sense in the video, but you don't get the full dimensional effect. Um, right. Yeah, so and that, what else have you been up to? Yeah, and then um, another major part of my work over the last ten years has been a collaborative practice with two other artists, um, Lauren Bonn and Rich Nielsen in Los Angeles. Uh, and this is uh, the the optics division of the Metabolic Studio. So this is part of the much larger Metabolic Studio practice, which is Lauren's studio there in Los Angeles. Um, but the liminal camera uh, is a shipping container, a uh, 20 foot long shipping container. This is the kind of stuff that comes from China. Yeah, up. and then it ends up at the uh, harbor, and nothing's going back, as we know. So there's just a bunch of them there. You can go buy one for a thousand dollars. Yeah, right? exactly. So, so this, you know, you poke a hole in the side of the shipping container, and the light comes in, and you have uh, a camera. Um, and so uh, we've we've been operating this camera over the last ten years, shooting uh, monumental scale photographs. So this. This is actually one of the smaller size negatives uh, that come out of this camera. Um, give you a sense of the, the scale we're working on. Basically, and, you have photographic paper on the far side from where the hole is. This yeah. Is what you're looking at. Yeah, yeah and, and we contact print those uh, to create um, positive images. 
So, so that's been a, a big, and, and then another project coming out of uh, uh, the optics division with, with Lauren and Rich uh, has been this inquiry into uh, kind of recontextualizing photography as a land-based practice. So, th so this adventure has taken us to all sorts of, uh, in all sorts of different directions, but one of the key uh, processes that we've developed in this inquiry is what we call lake bed developing. So we found this naturally occurring brine pool in the Owens Valley that actually acts like a photochemical agent. So it actually develops film, but as you can see, it develops film in a, in a very unique way. So you get this kind of metallic sheens, these unexpected colors and swirls of uh, chemical reactions that are all sort of natural processes coming out of the lake. So, um, so uh, we should pause for a second after this is over, just to look at this incredible photograph. Yeah. This is a photograph effectively where the Owen, you are taking, you are shining the pit hole of the Owens Valley and the Owens Valley is effectively taking a selfie here, right? I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Broad. Yeah, we, and... <laughs> we, you know, the, the way we think about it is this kind of idea of indexicality, this, this idea of a, of a, of a photograph of the landscape, sort of made entirely out of the landscape, so developed in the chemistry um, that that's naturally occurring in the land. It's worth remembering the reason this was naturally occurring chemistry is partly that the mountains all around the Owens Valley but it was still a lake, is where most of the silver was mined for what would become Eastman Kodak uh, 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 film stock. Yeah. And then brought back, and they were making westerns in those same mountains out of the film stock, out of the silver that was, but making the silver had poured all this horribly uh, uh, noxious stuff into the lake bed. And then when all the water of the lake was taken to California, there was just this brine with all these chemicals that turn out to be able to develop film. Yeah, you know, yeah. By the way, just for, there too, it, both in that fabric piece and in a piece I wrote about this whole process, which was called uh, Liminal Infrastructure. You can find them on my website. Two pieces I've written about you. The website is just lawrencewashler.com. But uh, yeah. anyway, so continuing. So those are two examples. Now what's this? So then, uh, yeah, the, the um... Another uh, process here, uh, let's see if I can get this to play, uh, has been this inquiry around uh, that was first inspired by coming across a passage in a ancient Chinese alchemical text um, talking about uh, a lens made out of ice uh, being used to start fire. Um, so I've been- well, Of course you had to do it too. <laughs> I've been exploring uh, making these special molds. Um, actually, some of the early experiments of this happened right here at the Exploratorium. So you can see here the ice lens in its special fixture melting uh, and the focal length changes actually as it melts and then uh, mounted in a camera here. Um, so actually using ice lenses as, a, as an imaging tool. And this is actually shot through the ice lens. So that is a picture of fire through yeah. ice. Yeah. And this is this is some documentation I took of aftermath of uh, forest fires here in California. Um, yeah. As seen through ice. Wow. Yeah. But that's uh, that's all the, the in the past. So um, and so a few years ago, you arrive at, uh, or before that, you, you, you start playing with another idea. Yeah. Which brings us to the immediate prelude to uh, what you ended up doing there at the Exploratorium. But tell us about this idea. Yeah. So what, what ultimately led to the piece Aperture Lucida was essentially a simple thought experiment of imagining this idea of imagine a board uh, with a bunch of holes poked in it. And all of the holes are angled such that they all face towards a uh, point floating out in space. Um, so 
I kind of imagined this idea and was thinking that this would uh, create uh, basically like a, a simple, the way I was thinking of it as, as, a, as like a very crude hologram um, in the sense that it would create a, a virtual object, uh, a little point that would float of light that would float in space. So, you know, then I set about thinking about how I could make this. Uh, Easier said than done. Yeah, so the first attempt uh, involved a really simple device of just drilling a hole in a board. And then, as you can see, this needle tool uh, can be moved around and poke through this uh, foam core sheet. Um, and it just requires poking a lot of holes. It turned out that a lot, a lot of holes. <laughs> this first attempt was uh, a little too crude. The, the pivot point where that needle passes through the board wasn't really precise enough. So uh, I set about machining uh, this gimbal uh, that kind of allows uh, all axes of freedom. And this rod can slide through this, um, this little bushing here. And basically, you can see how this is a, a more precise version of the same thing. Um, and the process was pretty labor intensive. It basically just involved uh, taking this needle and poking these holes one <laughs> hole at a time. And so over the course of uh, a couple months of uh, you know doing this uh, when, when, whenever I had time uh, and nearly giving myself like a repetitive stress injury, uh, <laughs> I, um, I ended to interrupt up you and say that as your friend, as one of your friends during this period, we began to fear for you. Uh, <laughs> th th this was the period when uh, what has happened to him, and will we ever see him again? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Emerge somehow. And that, you know, so as you can see, it's a lot of holes, um, and the result uh, was this. So you can see that subtle. Can you guys see that subtle sort of a uh, little glint of light that's barely visible through there? This um, is what it, this is exactly what he said. He <laughs> dragged all of us into his little studio and and would do this and say, "See it, see it." And he'd be very excited. We would be a little yeah. bit bewildered. Yeah. So somehow, many of my projects start with something that somehow, when I try to show it to other people, they can barely see it. You know, with the early scratch holograms. I had these little pieces of metal and plastic with these things on them and I'd show them to people and they'd be like, yeah, I, I guess I can kind of see it. I can kind of see what you're talking about, but I'd be like, look, it's, you know, it's this amazing. You were and so <laughs> excited. You were, you were a puppy. You were just, you know, you just were saying, well, okay. You were telling me that there was one person who, who saw it right away. Yeah. Well, uh, so the folks at the museum of Jurassic technology have always been, you know, the a real supportive community and yeah especially with the you know with well with all of this stuff but i remember distinctly with the um hand-drawn holograms i would show i would show people and everyone would be like yeah i don't know i can't quite see what you're talking about but david wilson was one of the early people that you know when i showed it to him he he was very encouraging and just like oh you, you know yeah 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 i see it i see it you know <laughs> no, I think that <laughs> David Wilson is the uh, founding director of the Museum of Jurassic Technology, and you had a little cubbyhole in the back of the museum in, in, uh, where you did a lot of this this experiment. Yeah, I think I think in in retrospect, he was probably just uh, being polite. <laughs> no, <laughs> <That's he's... laughs> <too fun. laughs> so the next step, obviously, from there, uh, after giving myself nearly giving myself carpal tunnel. Uh, was to automate this. And uh, so, and this is actually where I st started the conversation with the Exploratorium. So the first prototype that we made at the Exploratorium using uh, a CNC machine, a robot to poke all of these holes. Um, you can see here, Liz Keim from the Exploratorium playing with the early prototype there. And what followed was not to get emphasized that every single one of these holes is at a different angle, precisely determined different angle, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there were a lot of engineering kind of uh, difficulties that we had to overcome. To it's not 
quite as simple as as you would think just to uh but have, believe me, I didn't think it was ever going to be simple. But go just, just to have the robot do it, um, it actually required it's a it, the this simple device that I built with the uh, you know this uh, needle poking device, right? Um, it actually is uh, is accomplishing. So this this simple mechanism is actually accomplishing something that in the CNC world is is pretty complicated it's a five axis operation um, so we had to do some clever kind of uh, trickery to even be able to get the cnc machine uh, to be able to kind of reproduce this this effect um, but we did a lot of prototyping uh, actually too many uh, various little different prototypes to even go into here, but I included a selection of some of the major steps. So after we first figured out kind of the basic of how to get the, the image made, then we started scaling up a little bit. And we also started um, troubleshooting this idea of how the effect could cross a corner um, and, and starting to think about not just having one sheet, but having multiple sheets that could actually meet and um, the basic idea of this uh, this corner operation is to create like a full 360 degree illusion. So here's a model, and notice how as this spins around, as it's the it's configured in such a way that as the ball of light sort of falls off one side, it gets picked up by the the next uh, panel. So you really have this full 360 degree experience where you can walk all around it. Let's make clear, by the way, that this ball of light is a ball of light. There is no ball. This is just <laughs> immaterial glowing in midair. Yeah. Right? And, and of course, what you can't see once again, because we're looking at a flat screen, is the, the dimensional effect. So in any of these, uh, these videos, like when Liz is manipulating this thing here, you can kind of get the sense from the parallax uh, as the motion parallax as she moves it around. But that ball of light is a good, you know, foot and a half behind the screen that she's holding. So um, from there, once we kind of sorted out this corner question, we uh, we still were not sure how this thing would scale once we went up to the much larger scale that I wanted to to be able to do. So we, this is a, another prototype um, here. And notice this, this prototype has these secondary images. So there's kind of this flower pattern around the central uh, sort of virtual object of the ball of light. Um, so Again, that was- this, this is not, uh, this is floating in midair. What you're actually looking at are, are a bunch of dots, but, yeah. but it has this effect of being yeah, and and um, you know, basically the 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 concept for the final piece is is illustrated here. So, creating uh, our you, the the lines that you see there are showing the kind of directions of the light paths, and we have all of these holes um, that are all focused and pointing towards that one central point. Um, so. <clears throat> Again, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of the the sort of troubleshooting around this project was around, you know, just the sheer number of holes we had to drill and trying to figure out how to get the machines to be able to feasibly do this and get them to line up the way we needed them to. Can you imagine any other place but the Exploratorium where you could do this kind of work? <laughs> I mean, the Exploratorium really was the perfect laboratory to be doing this. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that helped uh, to to make this happen. That's uh, Ray Grunig there, um, who worked with me on through most of the entire process. Uh, Peter Taylor was instrumental. Um, uh you know, we, we had a, a, a lot of amazing, uh, amazing minds going, going into the, uh, you know, there are a lot of conversations just about, you know, how do we make this happen? What kind of tooling do we need? How can we, uh, how can we get it to work? Uh, 
So uh, here's, uh, so installation was, uh, was no small feat either. We had to build a special kind of rig just to get these panels up um, and align them. But the- For those of you who are there in the audience, when you go back and look at the thing, look at it from the, from the side, and you realize it's like five different panels for each. Ten, each actually. Each monolith or Ten. five panels with yeah. whole different different points in the panels and so forth. Yeah, so actually each each individual uh, panel is made up of 10 discrete sheets. So that gives you an idea of, uh, you know, we had to, so every single hole is actually 10 holes um, that need to line up. Um, so, this is the finished piece. And actually, I'm going to just run this uh, short little set, uh, intro to the video, which the full video, it's a little, it's like a five minute video online, but I'm just going to run a, a minute or so here. You can watch it on YouTube if you want to see the full thing, but this gives you a sense of the piece. As the viewer walks towards this ball of light, it very much appears to be in the space of the room. And as they move back and forth or change their position, the ball of light behaves like an object that has permanence in the room. And then as you actually approach and then step into the ball of light, the experience opens up and shifts radically. The ball of light sort of expands to, to consume you, um, and at the same time sort of explodes and, and disappears. At that point, the mechanism of the sculpture becomes apparent. What appeared to be this black monolithic surface is in fact riddled with holes, and these holes are all precision aligned in order to create this optical illusion. So, <clears throat> A couple things uh, on the on the um, video. So, one of the effects which we were exploring is so not only does this configuration of holes create this virtual ball of light, but this experience of then walking into this ball of light. Of course, when you reach that central focus point, all of the holes are oriented toward you, and so suddenly, what was this? you know, black wall um, becomes like a transparent screen that you can see through. So that was one of the, the effect. The effect is of blowing your mind. <laughs> and that's what I mean, you are, you are, there is a kind of subject object relationship to you, you there's the ball, there's you, there's the ball, there's you and then suddenly, woof. Yeah. And one of the really fun things to experience is how people physically viscerally react. I mean, some people actually sort of uh, flinch almost as they pop into the ball because it feels like you're walking into something. Um, and so it, it's one of the most gratifying parts of this piece was just being able to see visitors interact with it and just discover for themselves all of the different ways that they could explore it. I was thinking um, that people exploratory of their social science division should have a little window into this thing and just watch people's reactions. Yeah. And, and another thing I wanted to mention from the, the video the, that we watched formerly is um, the, and actually I'm going to back it up and just kind of play that first part again. Um, so the sound that you're hearing is actually a sound installation that's in the room. Um, and so when you walk into the room, you hear kind of one noise that's happening, which you're hearing now. But then as you walk into the ball of light, there's actually a, um, a directional speaker that focuses sound as the viewer walks into that, this into that focal point. And so when you actually walk into the focal point, there's another part of the composition that uh, that happens in that in that focal point. 
It's um, not just light waves, it's sound waves too. Yeah, so so it added, so I knew that I wanted to have some kind of sound element and that this kind of directional speaker would, would be a part of it. And um, uh, this uh, composer, uh, Matt Barbier, uh, who's based in Los Angeles and also part of the Museum of Jurassic Technology family, um, he, he composed this, uh, this amazing kind of sound score uh, for that, that piece. And also the Exploratorium's uh, Wayne Grimm was instrumental in making all of that come together, helping me to think through the acoustics of the, the space and helping to measure what the resonance of the room was so that uh, Matt could, could kind of compose that piece and, and thinking about the acoustics of this uh, directional speaker. But um, the effect is is pretty profound because uh, not only do you have this optical cue of this seeing this ball of light, you're also hearing it when you're in the space. I, I would suggest that this goes back to your interest in the phenomenology of the sound of of a Japanese tea ceremony. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, Mats, Matsukaze, the the um, the the sound of the kettle and the tea ceremony is is called uh, wind in the pines. Yeah. Um, so also, by the way, you were pointing out in that in that piece about how it's a that laughter can break out at any time. Mm. Mm -hmm. One of the sounds of the tea ceremony where it's it's kind of silence and laughter. And that's definitely what's going on in that room. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I think that um, you know, this uh this piece really is about playing with with space and kind of void. Um so uh there's this tension, right, between looking at um and looking through, right? Um, mm -hmm. and so, you know, one of the experiences of this piece is this thing that you think you were looking at, that you think is here in space, when you actually come up and get there, it dissolves and you realize that you're actually looking through and that you're seeing what you thought was here is actually there. Right. Um, so, but also it, it has a feeling of being seen. It's it has, not, it's, when you get into the point where every point is pointing at you yes you are said it's not you are you know just casually looking at something something suddenly you are seen yeah and the you, whole world's you know uh, there's no place that does not see you you must change your life the real capo i mean <laughs> exactly that it's it's that it, of deep moment. yeah and the, and the piece really is about kind of it's it's sort of the the sculpture is like a device for exploring different points of view. And there's a lot of things that you can do actually with, with someone else where you can say, okay, you stand there and I'll, I'll try doing this. And it's, it's actually a fantastic uh, experience to explore with other people. Um, but um, yeah, I guess one that, thing, that, that I also. Think, one of the things that's interesting here is that this whole discussion is, is the world as play. But uh, you and I have been having some conversations recently about how it also rhymes with a far darker thing in recent history. Yeah. We, we, may, we, we might want to gradually move over to justify the title of this entire talk, <laughs> the holographic cat, uh, panopticon. Yes, yeah. So, um, so the panopticon is uh, a prison design actually proposed by a man named Jerry, Jeremy Bentham um, in the late 1700s. And so the basic structure of the Panopticon is um, it's, a, it's an idea of constructing a prison so that a single guard uh, could monitor all of the prisoners from one position. So from a central guard tower, uh, there's a view afforded into all of the cells. So here you can see this is actually one of the few existing prisons uh, built following um, Jeremy Bentham's design. This is- uh, Jeremy Bentham incidentally was the famous uh, founder of utilitarianism. Exactly. A very important philosopher. Yeah. And he was doing this, I think, as not as some sadistic bad thing, but as a some kind of, well, um, you know, restorative, redemptive, I don't know, um, 
uh, correctional institution. You know? Yeah, yeah. And of course, this became central to Foucault's kind of examination of um, the, the systems of, of power, right? Power and knowledge. Um, so this is, this is the Stateville prison, actually in my home state of, uh, of Illinois. Um, and uh, it's, this is one of the few prisons uh, kind of built along uh, Bentham's design. And you can, so you can see here, here's the central guard tower. And then we have all of these cells arrayed around it. And then uh, you can see these are, this is tracing the viewpoints, the sight lines out of that central guard tower. Um, and so, you know, you can see uh, the, the similarities here. Um, when but, did that occur to you, by the way? <laughs> At what stage of all this did you settle into? Oh, wait a second, what am I doing here? <laughs> what, what, say that again? At what stage? of the whole process did you suddenly have this this uh rhyme occur to you and was it unsettling when it did yeah i mean i think it you know it was the awareness was there um you know kind of from from the early prototypes but i think it was only once i really built the full scale one that uh I started really thinking of it more architecturally, right? Because Bentham's design is an architecture, and um, you know, once you start scaling this uh, this piece up to architectural scale, it really starts uh, calling that to mind more more clearly. Um, so clearly, the focal point of aperture Lucida functions like the position of the guard tower in the Panopticon, but you know. The question that I had was, you know, and this is this is something I've been thinking about since the pandemic, basically, after building this sculpture and uh, kind of experiencing it on an architectural scale, I started to wonder, does the similarity go further? Um, does the panopticon actually project a virtual, you know, a virtual ball of light? Um, and does it, so in other words, does the panopticon function as a holographic optical device. Um, like, By the way, the ones in, in, uh, in Indiana, no, where was it in? Illinois. Uh, in Illinois. Do they have windows on the far side that go through or do they, are their wall, the prisoners are just walled? Well, yeah, them. we'll we'll get to that. And, and, yeah. and But actually in Bentham's design, um, you know, having, having, uh, windows was was actually an, an essential part of the design, but to to kind of explore this and and test this theory, I I built uh, a, a model, um, and as we can see uh, uh, here, let's see if this will play. Okay, so I built a three D model, and if we look inside the Panopticon. That's, you can see the central guard tower there. And then we're gonna remove the guard tower. And I don't know if you guys can see that. This might be one of those things where I'm saying, can't you guys see it? <laughs> but- uh, Humor him, say we, yes, say yes. We have this- uh, Everybody this... clap and Tinkerbell will live. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully this looks kind of familiar. Um, so you can see that actually what it's doing is it's focusing and projecting light just like Aperture Lucida is cr like creating essentially like a virtual guard tower, even though we've removed the guard tower. So the next question of course is, you know, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's all fine and good in a computer model, but would, you know, an actual prison function this way, you know, th this is like a theoretical ideal situation. You know, certainly you wouldn't actually see this in a real panopticon prison. So I did a little more research and it turns out this is the ruins of the um, Presidio Modelo in Cuba, which was built in the 1920s. It actually follows Bentham's design more faithfully than uh, pretty much any other prison built, as far as I know. Um, 
And incidentally, in 1953, Fidel Castro and uh, 20 some of his uh, companions were also imprisoned here uh, in, after their first failed uh, attempt at revolution. But you can see uh, clearly, hope, hopefully you can see in this slide, uh, the Aperture Lucida style halo of light around the guard tower. And here's another shot from the same uh, ruined prison. And again, see, see the, um, how the light is, is being focused again. So that every person in that prison would have been seen, would have had a light on the a window on the far side yeah. that would present them in silhouette to yeah. the guard. It's horrifying. It's really, really <laughs> terrifying. Yeah. Apparently, I mean, in a way, it looks just like China today. I mean, that's basically the state that they're well, in. Well, I mean, really, it's like all of us today in, in our online lives, right? <laughs> the, the, the new panopticon is just how we trade our privacy for just kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of all-seeing all seeing well, eyes. Well, on that cheery note, um, <laughs> I thought maybe we could uh, begin to open this to people in the audience. Uh, who've been the eyes looking at us this whole time. <laughs> you, you are the, you are the uh, focus of a panopticon of viewers, both in-house in and in the world uh, watching by video. Maybe we can invite people there to, to respond to some of this, uh, if there's any questions. Yeah, do we have any questions in, in the in-person audience, perhaps? And I believe people in the world at large can be yeah, using that function. To, that's uh, true. The virtual folks, you can also ask questions uh, and we will pass those on. Oh, we have a question in house here. Uh, thank you very much. That's a wonderful piece. I had a question about the final um, uh, construction. You mentioned early on, you had a lot of uh, challenges making the angles of the holes yes. be appropriate. Using 10 different layers, did that eliminate that challenge? Could you go with just um, orthogonal holes for each of the layers? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so yes, it, it, uh, it simplified things in the sense of uh, that was a way of working around needing a five axis machine. So yes, all of the holes could be just straight orthogonal drilling operations, but it added uh, considerable complexity in the sense that every single hole was now made up of 10 separate holes that needed to line up precisely. Um, so uh, we, you know, it's, it's as with any kind of engineering challenge, right? You're, you're, you're kind of shifting the accounts around you're taking some of the difficulty off of this area and sh just shifting it over to another another area it's interesting by the way at the exploratorium so many of the displays that are about some physical process or some biological process or so forth it, the meta display is a display of remarkable ingenuity uh, on the engineering side you can imagine the entire different you could imagine doing a period at the museum at the exploratorium, which was only about the engineering of having made these different displays. Mm. It would be quite fascinating. Absolutely. So case it would be. And there's some amazing engineers who are are here. Yeah. Any other questions? We got an in-house question here from Craig. It's a little, uh, little frightening. Uh, how are you going to move it? And if you have to ship it somewhere, <laughs> we were work? just talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually interesting because, um, for those of you who know, um, you know, there's an entire field of, uh, interferometry and sort of, uh, metrology, more metrology. Um, and in fact, this, this particular optical effect um, could rightly be classified as a very constrained example of a moray. It's it's like it's like a moray pattern without any secondary or tertiary images. It's just the primary 
Moray. And uh, what that means is, so Moray metrology, they actually use Moray patterns to be able to uh, track minute movements. It's, it's, a, it's a way of it, uh, sort of uh, through the leverage, the kind of optical leverage, uh, kind of amplifying very slight deviations. And so the, the effect of that is that any very small movement between the front and back panel has a massive effect on the virtual image. So what that means is that all those seams, all those places where the image lines up, if any of those panels shift, the the image moves really wildly. So uh, it turns out that it's it we we it's actually a small miracle that it <laughs> came together as well as it did. And and Ray Ray Grunig was was doing some of the fine tuning when I was like at home sick. Uh, so he he got to deal with a lot of the really nitty gritty at the end, but. Um, it, it, it amazingly, it, it did work, but it is, it is a little bit uh, uh, tricky to get those, those panels lined up. So it's, it's not something you want to take down and put up every day. <laughs> Do us a favor and get rid of that prison so we can look at the other piece again if you can. That's a little bit disconcerting to see the prison behind you this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, we'll go there. There, yeah, let's go there. Okay, other questions? Anybody in the world writing in? An audience, uh, Nathan Birnbaum asks, hello, Tristan, how does this analog effect relate to the laser holographic phenomenon? Yeah, so I, that's a good question and thanks for asking it. Um, I've been playing it pretty fast and loose in this talk of, with using the word holography. So this of course is not truly a textbook hologram because it doesn't involve any kind of interference imaging. Um, so you know, this is, this is actually more rightly related to kind of um, barrier screen parallax kind of displays. Um, but I think it is actually very interesting to think of it in terms of holography because, you know, again, with the hand-drawn holograms, a lot of what I'm working with is trying to understand the fundamental structure of a hologram and trying to give um, sort of more uh, tangible, visible uh, uh, ways for people to interact with and understand how information about an image can be distributed across a surface um, and how, you know, uh, something like a single point um, can actually have information about that point distributed across a large area. So there, there, are, there is a lot to be said about, you know, um, uh, the, the, the relationship that this has to real holography. Um, unlike some other, you know, techniques that get called holography that really are just being called holography because they're 3D. Um, this, this actually, there's kind of a reason that I'm contextualizing it within the realm of, of holography beyond just its 3D-ness. This question is the live audience, and Tristan, we're way in the back. Okay. Yeah, so a minute ago, you uh, mentioned moray patterns and metrology. Yeah. Uh, for those of us who aren't versed in the jargon, can you break those down for us? Well, basically, um, it's, it's a little too much to get into here, but there's ways of uh, measuring, doing really precise measurements. So if... If you've ever been driving down the freeway um, and seen like fences that line up, like chain link fences, layers of chain link fences, that's a moray pattern. Uh, when you see that kind of other ghostly sort of pattern start to emerge or, or multiple screens lined up on top of each other. Um, and that kind of uh, patterning can be used to um, make really precise measurements. Um, of surfaces, so it's a it's a technique that um, is used in engineering and analysis. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I think we're getting close to the uh, 
end of uh, the online session. And and one thing I, I wanted to say before we go on that I wanted to yeah. add it to you, but um, those of you who are looking at me right now, my face in the screen uh, was, I was told to move it, you know, move my screen up and down until I got to exactly this thing by the people there in San Francisco I said, okay, now you're perfect. They did not realize, but they had me put my face in such a way that it feels right. And the reason it feels right, ladies and gentlemen, is because if you go from the top of the screen to the bottom uh, and you break it into a golden section, so it's uh, from the bottom and then you go to this level here, that's one, and then it's 0.618. So the, let me get over here. So the area from my eyes to the bottom, if that's one, the area from my eyes to the top is 0.618, which is the golden section. I mentioned this is because Walter Birch, the great filmmaker, has been obsessing about how this constantly happens in films, and that cinematographers with no knowledge that they're doing this constantly arrange to have uh, this be the right way. And if, my, if I were smaller, my eyes would be at that place and so forth. There's, anyway, the point of all this is that a week from tomorrow, Arts, letters, and numbers, and I will be having a conversation with Walter Birch about the golden section in cinematography. So you're welcome to go to Arts, Life, letters, and numbers, and you can register for that conversation. Also, and, also part of the uh, the Venice Biennale um, series of conversations, uh, Mr. Weschler's Cabinet of Wonder, right? Right. So anyway, that's just to give you a. And then you, I was going to ask you before we leave. What are you working on right now? Well, um, I Give think- Give us a little bit of preview. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, so we're at 8.59. So there's gonna be a hard ending for the uh, online people that we've been told we have to wrap up right at nine. Um, so but for those of you who are in the live audience, we, we can actually hang out and, and have a couple more questions uh, and, and continue if you wanna stay. But uh, I'm gonna just go ahead and, and thank all of the people in the live audience for joining us. Um, thank you. Um.